Good afternoon and welcome to our speaker series event. My name is Vaktan Kutkaradze and I am the Vice President Transformation Science and Technology for ATCO and I will be your moderator today. I would like to start by welcoming my colleague Andrea Kleiber Langen, who is Vice President for Transformation Commercial and Legal, who has some welcoming remarks and will introduce our speaker. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today and I'll turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Vakhtang. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome my ATCO colleagues and friends from the academic, business and community sectors to the sixth ATCO Space Lab speaker series about modeling COVID. Let me begin by saying that I'm honored to live and work in Treaty 7, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of the Siksika, the Kainai, and Bikani First Nations, the Tutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chniki, Beresba, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Wherever you're joining us from today, let's take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you are on. Let us also pay our respects to elders past and present in all of the communities where we live and work. I am a proud ATCO employee and a member of ATCO's transformation team. We're a close group of curious professionals with backgrounds in legal, commercial, engineering, mathematical and material sciences, business development, agile process, and even rocket science. In addition to creating ATCO Space Lab speaker series that brings us together today, ATCO's transformation team leads our Space Lab initiative. Space Lab is an enterprise wide framework of collaborative support for the creative energy of our colleagues. It is a source of funding and expertise for any ATCO employee with the desire to pursue sustainable new value for ATCO. These sessions are a chance for us to share knowledge and insights from thought leaders and from thought leaders across the, around the world, providing our ATCO colleagues and ATCO's network of peers, partners and friends with information on promising developments, trends and leadership in relevant areas. We hope that today will be another glimpse into what's piquing our curiosity and driving ATCO towards new horizons. Today's session on how data modeling has shaped our response to the pandemic is a familiar topic, one that shaped everyone's life experiences over the past 16 months. While the path through the COVID pandemic has been difficult, COVID modeling has played a central role in guiding health and other policy decisions. The data and modeling underlying those decisions has given ATCO reliable information, guiding us in caring for our people, our communities and our customers throughout our global operations. As we continue to navigate work and life with COVID, keeping safety first and encouraging people to get vaccinated, it's now my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker. Dr. Caroline Colleen is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at Simon Fraser University, where she works in the interface of mathematics and the epidemiology and evolution of pathogens. She holds a Canada 150 Research Chair in Mathematics for Evolution, Infection and Public Health. Her team develops mathematical tools connecting sequence data to the ecology and evolution of infections. She also has a long-standing interest in the, in the dynamics of diverse interacting pathogens, investigating topics such as how the interplay between co-infection, competition, and selection drive the development of antimicrobial resistance. She's developed numerous contributions to the ecological and epidemiological models. Professor Colleen will co-lead a new National Infectious Disease Modeling Network that will inform decisions related to public health and help Canada better prepare for future pandemics. 
She's also the 2020 recipient of the Radio Canada Scientist of the Year Prize and may be familiar to many of you as she has been mentioned, quoted and interviewed over 1600 times in international and Canadian media reports, sharing her impactful research and raising public awareness. Professor Colleen, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. With that, I will turn it over to Vakting to explain the format of today's session and to allow Dr. Colleen to get to what we really want to hear about, how modeling and public policy relate to each other. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrea, for great introduction to the speaker and this lecture. Again, welcome to all of you who have joined us. This lecture will be the sixth lecture in the ATCO speaker series. As Andrea mentioned, the goal of this series is to provide ATCO's workforce and other listeners with the information on the most promising development in the relevant fields, outline where the state of the art is now and who are the leading experts in these fields, and what is possible to achieve within 10, 15 years horizon. Before we get underway with today's lecture, I would like also to remind you that the session is a one-way video and audio format. You can see and hear the presenters, but they can't hear you, uh, which is not the greatest for audience feedback. That's why we're encouraging you to ask questions. You can do so by using the question icon at the right of your screen. We will open up question fun functionality roughly midway through Professor Colleen's lecture. You can address your questions to her. With that, I would like to pass the microphone to our speaker, Professor Colleen. Uh, great to have you with us and please go ahead. Thank you very much for the kind introductions. I hope that people can hear me and if people can't hear me, someone send me a chat right now before I start sharing screen because after that I won't be able to see it. Okay. I'm going to, oh, now someone's sending a chat. They can't hear. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to share my screen and uh, jump right in. Okay, so can you see this? I hope that's a yes. If you can't see it, shout at me, please. Okay, great. Uh, so I want to talk about modeling and policy in the pandemic, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more brief, uh, just briefly in terms of the roles that I've had. So um, as you heard, I'm an infectious disease modeler and I do genomic epidemiology, thinking about how pathogens evolve and how we can learn about transmission by tracking their kind of very short term evolution. Um, I started working with the BCCDC, the BC Center for Disease Control, at the start of the pandemic and also have been working with the Public Health Agency of Canada and developing modeling in response to what they have been asking. And we had a team doing quite wide ranging modeling during the start of the pandemic, especially. Um, that said, my views here are my own and are not the views of those organizations. Um, OK. So the talk has several parts and aims to leave good a good amount of time for discussion because I think that's where it can get really interesting. Um, the first, so I'll, I'll talk about several different kind of modeling and COVID projects and I'll try to make links to policy um, throughout. So the first uh, thing that happened in the pandemic is really the pandemic started and we started flattening the curve and you heard probably lots of lots of talk about flattening the curve using distancing measures back in March 2020. And when that was going on, there were some very complicated models from out of Imperial College and others, you know, with 13,000 lines of C code and so on. But actually, uh, we looked at whether you could get to those same results with simple models, and you can. So I'll describe the modeling first and then the interactions that we had with policy around that time um, through the BCCDC primarily. OK, so social distancing now overly familiar. You're likely all sick of it. Um, OK, this model is based on kind of calculus differential equations, uh, but it has certain you know, conceptual ideas. OK, so one, people who are willing and able to do social distancing, they are less likely to go out and contact others. That's what distancing means. And they are on this cartoon in green. OK, when they do go out, they are less likely to bump into other people who are distancing because those other people are also sitting at home working on laptops and so on. OK, so in the model, we want a model that we want to describe, you know, what impact does it have if 
80% of the population are able to effectively distance. Not entirely, you still got to go to the store. And when you're there, you're, you may meet the people who, who work in the store and also others who, who are less able to, able or willing to do distancing. OK, so what is what happens to our pandemic if some people do some distancing? They do it by a certain amount in terms of how much they reduce their contacts. And we wanted to explore, you know, thinking that if you had COVID, you'd get immune, but you might be exposed before you show symptoms and you might transmit before you show symptoms. And pulling all of that information together into a model helps us to explore what the impact is likely to be of a decision like a social distancing or non-pharmaceutical intervention. OK, so then we take that idea. People stay at home if they can. Not everyone is able to. Some people have jobs where they have to work in person. Um, and we describe that using mathematical equations. Those equations are for the changes in the numbers of people who are susceptible, exposed, uh, so infected but not yet showing symptoms, infectious but not yet showing symptoms, showing symptoms staying home and isolating or quarantined and then recovered. So we look at the fraction of the population in each of these compartments or the number of, of people and how that changes over time. And we describe that with differential equations. Uh, and we then compare those model for case trajectories, how many people are, are symptomatic with data, we choose parameters that match the data. And then we interpret and we can use that match to build scenarios and to figure out what would happen if we increased distancing or if we decreased it. How much can we decrease our distancing measures before cases explode again? That kind of thing. So these equations uh, describe the rates of change of just two of these compartments, circles here. Um, in fact, it's these two, the susceptibles. And for those of you who like equations, I'll just describe this briefly. If you don't like equations, don't worry about it. Um, we have this fraction F here. We have the lower level is all the people who are willing and able to do distancing. That's why they've got D's on them. And the upper layer are people who are not able or willing to do social distancing. So maybe they have to work in person in a healthcare service and they can't do their work at home. Um, when they go out, they don't see other distancers as much and they contribute less to the force of infection. So th they have this F number, which is less than one. So when you go out, you're less likely to be infected by one of these folks because they're at home on their laptop. And that's really the key idea of the model. Everything else is just, you know, once you get latent infection, then later you get infectious and then later you get disease. Maybe not everyone's infectious, but OK. So that's the, the concept of the model and kind of how it works. Um, OK, these are some of the results um, and I'm showing lots and lots of little panels, some of which look exactly the same. So I'll just describe a little bit when, when you do this. Of course, you have all these parameters in the model that you could potentially change and many of them we don't know. And one of the things this gets back to the, the data question. Uh, one of the things we didn't know is just how many of the cases were we actually finding? Were there armies of asymptomatic people who were never being tested? Um, were there armies of people who were symptomatic but not being tested at the time or were we getting, you know, 40% of the cases? So as you go down from top to bottom on these little panels, um, we've increased the simulated fraction that we sample from lower to higher. Um, and then we had a little change on around April 14th. This is last year, so tiny little bump of cases in BC at the time, just a tiny little, little tiny wave of cases. Um, OK, so what I want you to notice here is the this thing, the fraction of contacts removed. This is kind of like one minus F. So how well is distancing working? And that's actually the same. It didn't really depend much on our assumption about whether we were finding 10 percent of the cases or 5 percent or up to 40 percent of the cases here. Uh, whereas the underlying transmission changed quite a bit. We it could be really transmissible, but we're finding fewer of the cases, or it could be not as transmissible, but we're finding more of the cases. Um, similarly, the actual number of infections changes a lot, right? If you think you're finding most of the cases, then you don't think there are as many infections in total. If you think you're only finding a few, there, there might have been lots of infections. But what we liked was that the effectiveness of distancing was really robust. It didn't depend on these things we didn't know. And there's a supplement on the internet somewhere with many pages of what about this? And what about that? What about this? And what about that? OK. So what happens with the model? Uh, in practice, because this was through collaboration with BCCDC and I think uh, was requested and well, not the exact model, but but modeling forecasts were requested by policymakers. 
Uh, sometimes we see this model popping up in Bonnie Henry's slides, and it's still used actually to look at um, forecasting not just infections, but hospitalizations. Um, early in the pandemic, it was used as a kind of communication tool. This is, we did that, those were that first bump, and then in the summer we had basically very few cases in BC. But then we did see the signs of early exponential growth in, back in June and July of last year. Um, that was probably the, the estimate from the model, and you could see it growing into the fall maybe one of these but but public health used this to kind of convey to the public all right if those of you who are you know able and willing to distance have really dramatically dropped the rate at which they bump into other people and risk COVID-19 transmission and that makes a huge difference over even a short time frame from you know 10 to 80 cases or 50 cases in these examples so I think it was used to kind of convey to the public and also for, you know, projections within public health. Um, okay, here's, I, I think it's really um, important in connecting models and research to policy or to decision making in general, whether it's policy or your own decision making, uh, to really set your science in context. And that's one of the things I've learned from this pandemic. Um, so this slide is about setting things in context. So Here's something from March 20th, 2020, which was a collaboration between me and Ivan Semenuk at the Globe and Mail. And this is about flattening the curve. OK, so these are three curves came from my simple model. Same one you just with the green and the pink people who are distancing and not. Um, and it shows, you know, this flattened curve, the so-called strong intervention uh, went up to about eight, seven or eight percent of the population being infected at the same time. Right. So let's just compare that to what we've actually done through the pandemic. Even the flattest of these flattened curves, just putting that in context, that would be about 40 or 50,000 daily cases in BC or Alberta, which are kind of comparable populations. Um, that's 10, maybe 20 times what we ever actually had. We had in BC, we topped out at about 12 or 1500 cases a day. And I think Alberta is maybe a bit more, but somewhat similar. Uh, we never did anything like this. That would have been 120 or 180,000 daily cases in Ontario. So we didn't flatten these curves. We actually stopped them from happening. And that's why by the end of, um, that was in March, April, January, that's why we're not here now with people immune, a ton of our population immune by natural infection, right? What we did was this in BC. We had this tiny bump, we call it a wave, and what we would have had if we'd gone back to normal social contact, in all probability, is, is something more like this. One of these curves, and even here, uh, modeled prevalence, so 400,000 is around 10% of BC, so that would be like one of these peaks, the medium intervention peak that would take place over a few months, and there it's a little sharper in this one. But it really sets in context, we didn't flatten these curves we stopped these curves from happening entirely in a way or we made such strong interventions that we stayed fluttering along the bottom okay context um right now there is a lot of uncertainty here are some new projections uh, that we made for PHAC a few weeks ago i guess at the end of june um and as you've heard you know we now have variants of concern we don't know how good the vaccines are against our variants of concern looks like pretty good against delta and the new data are emerging that are pretty promising we don't know delta's transmissibility in a reopened canadian population if we completely reopened at this time that's what the orange curves imagine um we don't know infectiousness of breakthrough infections we don't know how many people will want to be vaccinated so there's so much uncertainty um that's underlying these projections. And we can't really make predictions. We use these models to illustrate scenarios and show the timing and the consequences of assumptions. Okay, that was topic one. Um, I'm gonna move on now to vaccination, which of course was the next major change in the pandemic after social distancing in a way. Social distancing, we had up and down and up and down, and then wow, there came vaccines. And what were we gonna do? Um, and in particular, what would the vaccine rollout look like? Who should we vaccinate first? So we got interested in this question for two reasons. One was that I was interested in long COVID and outcomes of COVID that are not just um, not restricted to just hospitalization and death. 
Uh, and another was that the BCCDC asked us uh, to do some modeling around age and age-based rollouts and around the deferred second dose strategy. Um, at the same time, we were learning from Israeli data uh, more about vaccines and how they worked for COVID, and in particular, that they prevent infection, which is what you want them to do. It's what you want your vaccine to do. You don't want to just get measles, but, you know, get it less badly. You, you expect when you get a vaccine that it prevents you from getting the infection in the first place. And these vaccines do that. But um, I think there were conservative assumptions around like maybe they won't do that. Maybe they'll just prevent severe disease, uh, not preventing infection. And they, they kind of do both, but they do largely prevent infection. And that actually impacts the vaccine rollout. It really changes who you should vaccinate first and how you should prioritize things. Um, importantly, that's in the Canadian context or in the context of a Western jurisdiction like Canada that's been rolling out distancing and preventing its curves for the last 18 months. Okay, so this is a mathematical model, but I'm going to first show it to you in a cartoon form because you can actually get all of the ideas from the model uh, from these cartoons and these cartoons are also a kind of model. <coughs> okay, so here's my cartoon model. So I've got a low transmission scenario and I'll just take you through like who these cartoon people are. So it's a simplification of the real world. And in this simplification, I have blue people and I have gray people. OK, and the blue people are vulnerable. They are maybe like those who are over 85 and they're very uh, at risk of severe disease if they get COVID or maybe they're over 80 or other very vulnerable people. They are not typically the people who are you know, working in your grocery store um, and having high levels of contact because, you know, LOB. All right, so then the gray people are the, the, the kind of transmitters, the, the working adult population who work in person and don't spend their whole day sitting at home on their laptop. In this model, our only priority is to protect the vulnerable. So we're not worrying about long COVID and the essential workers, none of that. Not worrying about the kids, that's you know tragic, but, but we're only worried about the blue people. Okay, so. The red arrows are the path the virus takes through the simulated population. And I'm going to do two experiments. All right, so in experiment one, I'm going to vaccinate the vulnerable. I've got five vaccines, restricted supply. It's February in Canada. I got five vaccines. I'm going to go, oh my God, these blue people, they're really vulnerable. You got to get as many of them as possible. Okay. In my other experiment, I'm going to vaccinate some of the, I'm going to vaccinate five of these essential workers, the gray people. Okay, so here we go. And when I vaccinate one, I'm going to prevent their infection from going to their next, the next person in the chain because I've prevented them from getting sick enough, prevented them from getting infected or sick enough to transmit. Simple model. And when I stop a transmission event with that, I'm going to color that edge in yellow. So here's a gray character. I vaccinated them and they uh, didn't then infect this one who didn't infect these two and then eventually there were two vulnerable people who never got exposed because I vaccinated this one gray person. Now the same thing, this one actually wouldn't have been infected anyway because their infection was prevented by this vaccination. But okay, here's two other vulnerable people who were protected from this one not being infected. And then same over here. Okay, so I'm gonna do a tally and I'm gonna just compare what happened. So when I vaccinated the vulnerable in my first experiment, I had five people who I protected and I actually prevented three cases in the vulnerable, right? So, okay, I used five doses or five vaccines and I protected, I, I prevented three cases. When I vaccinated high contact people, I vaccinated five people directly. So I protected these folks who, you know, they don't they don't get infected. It's still nice for them. They don't have to miss work and they don't get long COVID and whatever. But I've actually prevented six cases in the vulnerable. So even if my only goal is protecting the vulnerable and I don't prioritize at all the benefits of preserving workplaces and, you know, parenting and not having long COVID and uh, these things. I still do better vaccinating the people with high contact and indirectly protecting the vulnerable because I get better bang for my buck with my vaccine. Okay, I'm gonna run the experiment again, but I'm gonna change the transmission rate to be much higher. And the same people, same setup, same thing, but now I have more red arrows. And here when I do my experiment, if I vaccinate the vulnerable, I actually do a little bit better. I prevent five cases because all five of them would have been exposed. 
in the time frame of my vaccination. When I vaccinate the high contact, I in, in total, I prevent nine cases, but only four of them are in the vulnerable. So I prevented all these five in the in the gray people who I said are not the priority here, and then four more in the vulnerable. So actually, if my goal is only protecting the vulnerable, I do better if the transmission's really high and everyone's going to be exposed by directly protecting them. OK, that's the cartoon model. We can also make that model using math. We can use differential equations and we can include, you know, essential workers, but also <laughs> regular members of the population and elderly people who can also still have contact. You know, so it's not as simple as this cartoon model, right? So we took a model that uh, some colleagues at Harvard uh, developed, which had ordinary differential equations, it has vaccinated people uh, who don't get infected after they've been vaccinated. It has unvaccinated people and it has vaccinated people who who got unlucky enough that they may uh, still get infected. So these are breakthrough and they may still transmit to others. OK, and then we had contact patterns for age groups that were estimated for Canadian populations. Um, and we have an infection term that says, OK, so how like how what force of infection is landing in your age group? Well, it depends on the susceptibility in your age group. Maybe you're lucky and you're two years old and you're not very susceptible. Um, and then a contact between different age groups and then a, some of the different people uh, who could be infectious in that age group. Um, OK, and then we model social distancing by removing workplace contacts and scaling back other contacts. Uh, in such a way that the model looks like data from BC in the fall. And so this is now a complicated model with you know, 127 different classes because there's age classes and vaccination and essential worker classes and so on. But we can do a sanity check and say, OK, it's not completely off, um, off the wall in terms of the number of cases that it predicts or the numbers of hospitalizations or deaths that it predicts. And so in the same way that we did with the distancing model, we can say, all right, we've got this model kind of looking like our data. Now what happens when we do things and we can explore scenarios in a way that is fast and cheap and uh, doesn't require experimenting on humans in the real world, of course. Um, OK, so what happens? Well, what happens is just like in the cartoon model um, that if you vaccinate the high contact people, the gray people, the essential workers in this model, you end up not only with fewer infections and less long COVID, you end up with fewer deaths and hospitalizations, so you do better at protecting the vulnerable by vaccinating essential workers early in the program. Um, so I want you to compare, there's a lot of panels on this slide, I want you to compare A, oldest first, and this shows the portion vaccinated over time by age, showing 80 plus come first in January and February, and then the rest of the age groups until now. Um, I want you to compare that to C, where we do 80 plus, and then when they're done, we start with essential workers of any age, and then we continue with the age rollout. Okay. So if we compare A and C, what we want to compare is a plot here and the plot beneath it. So I'm going to zoom in. So this is infections, so new cases per day in, uh, this is a BC model. So we have our oldest first gives, you know, when we reopen in March or we have a variant arrive in March, which indeed we did, we get a huge bump. This We didn't do this because we, you know, this modeling was done before, we, but we, this is what would have happened uh, in the model what, on reopening in March uh, or having a high transmission variant arrive in March. OK, so let's compare this oldest first to oldest and then essential workers and then the rest. And you get fewer infections, of course, because you've prevented a bunch of transmission chains because we know vaccination prevents infection. If you're not infected, you can't infect your coworker and they can't infect their coworker and they can't infect their grandmother and so on. OK, when you look at hospitalizations, the difference is less stark because, of course, older people are more likely to be hospitalized and you've delayed their protection a little bit. but you still see fewer hospitalizations because you've prevented people from being exposed in the first place. And the same thing with deaths. You see many fewer deaths because there are people who would have died if you'd exposed them who never got exposed. OK, so. Again, as with the social distancing model, when we said, OK, well, you know, what about this? We don't know this and we don't know that. So we have there's a lot of what abouts here, right? Because we don't know 
how much contact the you know sort of non-essential workers really have. We don't know who's you know who's this high risk, high contact exactly. How many? Um, we don't really know exactly the strategy. Maybe our model is a simplified strategy. Of course, uh, we don't really know all these parameters. So we explored um, how the model changes and how the results change depending on exploration of these things we don't know. And basically we found vaccinating essential workers sooner after the 80 plus, not immediately, but after 80 plus is, is better. That message is robust to all of this. So in these plots, you can compare the green bar baseline oldest to youngest to C. So A to C is green to purple. And you can see purple is always lower than green and it's always lower than green by quite a bit, no matter what you change about all these strategies, underlying transmission, and so on. OK. Um, one of the pushbacks we got, we presented this a lot because it was a message I decided to really try to get out there. And I've had a lot of media interviews in the past year and a half. And this one, I accepted all of them and said, OK, this is what I want to say. The pushback we often got from doctors and others was what I call the intuition model, which is also a model. Uh, and that is this, given the high fatality rate in the elderly, how could it be possible that delaying their vaccination at all, even for three weeks, could ever be better? Okay, so that's a good question, because especially if you're, you know, if you're in medical practice and you're used to treating the individual in front of you and you're not as used to thinking about population level effects, like preventing exposure in the first place, that this may seem really counterintuitive. Okay, but the intuition model assumes two things. It assumes that everyone's equally likely to be exposed and that people don't infect each other, right? So, you know, if everyone's going to have this risk randomly rain down on them, sure, of course, you have to protect the people who are most at risk of a severe outcome. But it's not true that everyone's going to be exposed. Those elderly people who might be at risk if they get infected don't have to be infected. We don't have to infect everyone. We're in Canada or the US or the UK or the EU or Israel, or most of the jurisdictions, South Africa in the world have used distancing to prevent everyone from being exposed. So both of these assumptions are wrong. Um, and intuition is a model too. It's just a model that's hard to, to interrogate with data. Um, when intuition says, you know, we have to vaccinate the most vulnerable first, it's not taking into account these two wrong assumptions. When we take those into account, even with a cartoon, we get a different answer. Vaccinate essential workers earlier in the program. Okay, back to the policy. I think this was done at request of BCCDC, uh, and they did do this to some extent. It's it's always, you know, there's always political challenges. You couldn't say, like, start with 20 year olds, all of them, even if some model said it was right. It's just, there, there are many factors. And I think these models, don't tell you what to do. The models help frame the decision that you're making, and then you make the decision, or in this case, public health makes the decision. Um, they did decide to prioritize frontline workers, as they called them, and they didn't like the phrase essential workers here in Ontario. That phrase was much more, uh, more used. Um, here they used frontline workers, uh, including first responders, grocery stores, teachers, childcare workers were eligible for uh, vaccination earlier than the strict age based rollout. And they used AstraZeneca for that, but I think they did also use some mRNA vaccines for that um, prioritized strategy. Other provinces did this too. We presented this in Ontario to the Ontario Science Table and the Modeling Table. And uh, it really aligned with work around neighborhoods and disproportionate burden of COVID in neighborhoods with a lot of essential workers. And so um, that I think did help shift the conversation on policy in Ontario as well. But not not only our voices, but I think we you know we were complementing other voices with other sources of information. Okay, we had vaccines, we had distancing, we had vaccines. Now we have evolution and I'm going to check how I'm doing for time. Um, probably not too bad. Okay. So this is a picture of um, the SARS-CoV-2 global diversity taken from GizAid, which is a public database of sequences. Each dot in this colorful little wheel represents the RNA sequence of somebody's COVID infection, somebody's SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and it kind of shows like it originates in the center and time goes out from the middle uh, to the ring to the outside as we move from the past to the present. So around uh, last year sometime, 
we started seeing variants of concern, B117, it's not 17, sorry. That's now called alpha. This is gamma. This is uh, beta. And now, of course, we have delta, which isn't on here yet. Um, so it didn't do much in terms of interesting, you know, new variants until the middle of last year when we started seeing the alpha variant coming through the UK. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about like where we think this virus might be going. So before now, we have had mostly in the world uh, susceptible populations, right? People who have not been vaccinated, vaccines weren't approved, they weren't really widely deployed in large populations until fairly recently. And at that time, um, selection would favor a more transmissible virus. So if the red person is infectious, the best virus is going to be able to get to the most blue people. That's so the most transmissible. And that's really alpha and, and delta have had that selective pressure and they have become extremely infectious. Uh, now selection is going to begin to favor immune escape. So in this population, highly immunized, a virus that is more transmissible will have an advantage like delta, but an even better advantage is going to be a, to a virus that can get into vaccinated individuals. OK, so what might happen? Well, a vaccine escape strain might appear. And it will appear faster if the mutation rate is faster, if the transmission rate is faster, so Delta, if there are lots of unprotected people for, so you can get lots of cases um, and lots of infectious people. So you can get lots of viruses because that's what gives the virus the opportunity to do this. Um, we can slow that down using control measures to stop transmission, trying to reduce circulating infectious people, case finding, contact tracing, isolation, support for people to isolate, not in their large household and so on, um, time off work, etc. And of course, vaccination, reducing the number of people who are unprotected. We can't really change the mutation rate of the virus. We can monitor immune suppressed patients where variants might emerge and we can try to look at whether some viruses mutate faster. Uh, but OK, that's in terms of trying to prevent the appearance of an escape virus. So I'll get back to that when I talk about Alberta at the end. Um, we can also try to reduce the spread of an escape variant. If it does happen, um, it'll spread better if there are lots of infectious individuals of that type and if they can interact with immunized individuals. So, so if there's a lot of mixing between people with a virus and people with immunity, that will give an opportunity for an escape strain to spread. And so we can reduce that by reducing transmission in general or jumping up and down to try to stop specific variants of the virus. To do that, we have to find them and know where they are in time. Um, we can do that with focused high density vaccination. So hot spots and whole communities at a time rather than kind of 50% everywhere. 50% so of the places at 100% coverage ends up better for this picture. OK, how will we know if this happens? So, you know, we've seen this with Delta and with the other variants, kind of by the time it's on our radar in Canada, it's already here. And that was even with the border closures that we've had until now. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, knowledge of risk of a new variant as vaccine escape requires data that we don't typically share. So are they breakthrough infections? You have you have a sequence that's on this gizade that I showed the little wheel picture. Uh, but we don't know whether the people who had that infection were vaccinated. We don't know whether they were clustered together or vaccinated people infecting each other or whether something's just been sampled because they want to sequence a particular outbreak or as part of a research study, or is it really actually spreading more? And we never really have data on symptoms and severity. So if you want to know if there's a severe vaccine escape strain and you're a scientist or a federal uh, government a person, researcher, or policymaker, you actually can't know the things you need to know. Um, and by the time these are published from international sources, um, you know, by the time you know severity, it it may well be established here already. Okay, and it, what if it emerged within Canada? Of course, we have cases here too. We could have a VOC emerge here. It hasn't happened yet, but we, it could happen. When would we act? So you might say, well, what's a reasonable indicator? Like we don't want to just act all the time. I guess. Um, so maybe if it caused more breakthrough infections or if it doubling time was faster or hospitalizations increased faster or or it had a higher proportion of cases like Delta has been growing or maybe it caused bigger outbreaks in settings in workplaces, for example, or maybe it caused more severe outcomes. 
Okay, these are all totally reasonable. But the problem is for all of them, except maybe the first one, maybe, by the time we know them, it's too late to prevent the spread because these indicators need data cases, but also virus sequences to know if it's of a specific type linked with symptoms and severity. So linked with what happened, the outcome and linked with vaccination status uh, and maybe households or, or you know, outbreaks in workplaces. So these are not routinely linked in Canada and where they are linked, they're not generally available to scientists. Um, but also just timing, by the time we know the fatality rate, you know, if it's 1%, you need hundreds and hundreds of cases to estimate that 1%. By the time you have hundreds and hundreds of cases or thousands, um, it, you know, it has to, you have to have those thousands of cases. So prevention has already been lost. Okay, so I'm going to end with some perspectives and uh, kind of state the case for cases. The case for, you know, what I mean is the case for still paying attention to the number of infections and thinking about it, despite um, probably what's a current view now, a current optimistic view. Okay, so here's an optimistic view, and I think it kind of prevails, and I think it's largely completely reasonable. Um, okay, so, and it has five points. So the first one, because we've vaccinated, especially the elderly, but lots of people, the relationship between infections and hospitalizations is changing or has changed. Um, so the most at risk are the best protected, which is great, uh, and breakthrough infections are much less likely to be severe. So if you've been vaccinated and you did get unlucky and get COVID anyway, it's probably going to be much more mild, which is great. Okay, the second is, you know, the only reason we restricted people was to protect the healthcare system in the short term. This may not be correct, but it, it's a simplification, but I've heard this view stated. Uh, we didn't do that to prevent long COVID or to prevent VOC or to prevent you know, infection itself. We did this because and when we started to see challenges in the healthcare system, and in particular to acute care capacity, whether that's beds or staff or ICU or whatever it was. Okay, but now infections are no, no longer a big threat. So we don't need to do that anymore. Um, and we don't want to restrict people's social lives and interactions, um, even if they test positive. So we're moving to this more endemic mode. You've heard of the flu and we don't shut the world down over flu, even though we know elderly people die every year from flu. Um, and furthermore, you know, with increasing activity, contact tracing, which is kind of limited in effectiveness anyway, is going to be really hard because, you know, if, let's imagine you go to a nightclub and then you go to a restaurant or the other way and then you go to work. You'll have so many contacts, it'll be hard to chase them all up. And anyway, we don't need to control infections, so this may not be as useful an activity as it was when people were only seeing three people a week and we really needed to control infections. So I think this is the line of thinking that is probably the, the reasonable line that would be behind Alberta's recent announced changes to you know not do contact tracing, to recommend but not legally require people to isolate. Um, and, you know, I think I think a lot of chief medical officers of health or, and a lot of people in public health are thinking along these lines. And, and I don't think that's unreasonable. I hope that this is completely right. Um, but I wonder if we should be so optimistic right now. So I would say, yes, the relationship between infections and hospitalizations is different. Um, but if you just do a back of the envelope estimate, which I did this morning, and you think, okay, so almost everyone is vaccinated um, and they're very well protected, There are, but there are lots of them um, and there are some unvaccinated people too. So let's imagine 80% of the infections are in unvaccinated people, uh, which could still be a huge level of protection because there are so many more vaccinated people. Okay, maybe it's 90%, whatever. Most infections are in unvaccinated people and they are more likely to be younger because we've vaccinated a lot of the older people in BC, 95% of those over 80. In Alberta, it's more like 90%, but you know, lots. Okay, vaccine over 90% effective against hospitalization, even if you get infected anyway. Um, if you kind of work this out, this leads to about a third as many hospitalizations per infection as before, not a hundredth. And that's just because most of the infections are in unvaccinated people. So the effectiveness of vaccines is great. Most of the people are vaccinated. Most of the infections are not in vaccinated people. So, you know, in terms of just a ballpark, maybe we can withstand about three times as many infections as before, not 10 times or 100 times. We can't just kind of let it completely rip and not worry about it at all. And I don't think anyone's proposing that. Um, so, okay. 
there are a lot of unvaccinated people because not everyone's eligible and not everyone eligible is vaccinated. That includes kids. If you're if you're one of those who think that kids transmit. There are also a lot of groups of people who are unvaccinated who socialize together, either by geography, by age, by opinion uh, and so on. Uh, vaccinated people can still get infected. It's very much less likely, but they could transmit. And with a really highly infectious variant like Delta, that lets the virus reach those unvaccinated groups. It provides little bridges for the virus to get over, to get to unvaccinated people. And uh, that means if you want to stop that, an even higher proportion of people have to be vaccinated to prevent that those bridges from being enough to get the virus to the unvaccinated. All right, so here's my, I did this yesterday, preliminary projection for Alberta. And this projection is if current vaccination rates stay the same in Alberta. I got them from um, Alberta Health Services webpage and I fit the, the vaccine model that I presented to the Alberta data and just show the, the rise. And what you see is a rise in infections in unvaccinated um, people, the, the green people here. And, and because there are so many vaccinated people, they, they cause quite a few infections. But in unvaccinated people, you get this big potential for a bump, which probably would challenge healthcare capacity because we haven't changed the relationship between infections and hospitalizations in unvaccinated people. Um, well, really at all, we've changed their age distribution because we've vaccinated more older people. Um, OK, so that's where I'm going to stop. And I want to thank uh, modelers in BC, especially Sally Otto. The evolution section was uh, joint with her. Um, and my own group at Simon Fraser and colleagues uh, involved in the vaccine work and, and others of this work and uh, the public health agencies, although, as I said before, opinions here are entirely mine and not theirs. Okay, thank you. I hear silence. I'm on silent. OK, there. I can see you now at least. Yep, thank you. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much for this uh, really uh, interesting and engaging lecture. Um, we're going to do, um, uh, next turn into our Q&A session. I would remind our listeners to use the question icon to ask questions. It's moderated format, so once the questions are published, you can see them and upvote if you like. Uh, we actually encourage you to upvote the questions uh, because the questions with the, uh, we will choose the most popular questions to go first. Um, so please, uh, um, please uh, show us which, uh, uh, which questions you would like to answer first. So our first question is, um, let me look at the list. Um, do you want me to stop the screen share or do you want to keep um, the screen share? No, th uh, that is not necessary. Uh, yeah, it's you, you, probably useful to keep the screen share okay. if you don't mind. Um, based on modeling, at what point does vaccination and herd immunity actually reduce infections to a minimum or zero? And or is this even a realistic expected outcome? Yeah, that is a great question. So if immunity was perfect and if we didn't have introductions from new from other places, we might expect a level of vaccination where we could get to extremely low or zero COVID. Unfortunately, I think immunity is probably going to wane um, to some extent and people can get reinfected and we will have introductions of COVID from other places. So even if we had very high levels of vaccination, I think what we would hope for is very low but endemic levels of COVID where it's kind of always around and sometimes tragically someone dies from it, but mostly we don't have to shut down the world over its impact on our healthcare systems or on our lives. So, you know, as to what level, that really depends what we're willing to do. So in a way, every time one of these curves turned around, it was a kind of herd immunity, like enough people were immune given these very strong distancing measures that were put in place that the, the curve turned around. And if you had kept that in place forever, 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 
it would have gotten to very low numbers and and or been eliminated except for introductions and little transmission chains. The problem is we weren't we don't want to keep those measures in place forever. What we want is no COVID when we're fully reopened. And for that, I think we probably need 90 percent or more of our entire population, including kids, to be vaccinated. And that changes because the virus is figuring out how to be more transmissible. If we were just talking about classic COVID, our targets that of 70 or 80 percent might have been fine. Um, but now we have variants of concern wh which were selected to have higher transmissibility. Now they do. That means we probably need more vaccination to get to that even kind of practical herd immunity where cases are kept low enough by vaccination that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. Thank you. Um, the next uh, most popular question is about uh, children under 12. And there's actually uh, one has just arrived and uh, one uh, one has been uploaded to the top. So um, the first one is, when do you expect that we will see vaccine approval for children under 12? And another one, um, what will be the rate of transmission among unvaccinated children under 12 and is it a cause for concern? Yeah, these are fantastic questions. The first one's a little easier. What I've heard is that we'll have the data from Pfizer in September. I suspect that Health Canada would act reasonably quickly within a matter of weeks. So hopefully sometime this fall we would have approval if indeed the, the data are good, right? If it looks good in terms of safety to vaccinate uh, under 12. And I don't know if that's going to be 5 to 12 or, or what exactly the, the range is. Um, how concerning is it? This has been an incredibly political topic and we did some modeling around schools and school transmission and we found, you know, based on data and I guess this is an unsatisfying answer, but you know, we found anything can happen. As with adults with COVID, often you have an exposure and nothing happens. No one gets infected, but sometimes you can get unlucky. You can have an infectious person land in a high risk room, maybe with poor ventilation and lots of dancing and singing, um, especially the singing or shouting. So then you can have a big cluster or bigger outbreak. And so I think it's clear that while kids are not hugely more at risk, kids of course can get and transmit COVID and they can get long COVID and they can get this MISC, this inflammatory uh, syndrome after COVID. So if we just stop um, all our mitigation measures and we let COVID run rampant through schools, that may be a, a huge cause for concern that doesn't mirror what we've been doing so far because what we've been doing so far has not had very many infections around because all the adults were distancing and there have been lots of mitigations in schools, especially high schools. So, you know, I don't think schools have been a huge driver and people have been hiding information about schools. I, you know, I, I think they have been done better than I might have expected. In BC, they were open throughout in elementary schools and largely, you know, I mean, I would want to say there were no problems. Of course, there was transmission. Um, but if we, you know, if we change mode and we have a highly infectious Delta variant now, and we agree that we're going to have lots more infections because we're not so worried about hospitals anymore, and we remove the mitigation measures, we may see a very different picture. So I do think it's something we shouldn't dismiss. This is a new virus because it doesn't lead to hospitals or ICU or death in kids at the same rates as adults. That doesn't mean it doesn't cause problems for kids. It doesn't mean the risk is zero. And I think we should be monitoring carefully and honestly and trying to keep um, to keep our minds open and keep keep data gathered and transparent so we can make good decisions. Thank you. And I was um, I have another question in mind, but uh, I will. Uh, there was a question about um, um, related to the children, so I will jump over the queue if you don't mind. And uh, that is the question. Um, uh, let me find it. Um, my family and I are fully vaccinated, but my toddler is not. Should I be cautious with the new open protocol in, uh, protocol in Alberta? What would you recommend? That's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think I want to make recommendations outside of public health. You know, like I said, toddlers are much less at risk than adults. But then, of course, you know, if you have much less than a million dollars, you may still have quite a bit. That, that may still be an intolerable <laughs> level of risk to you. Um, I think, it, you know, it, we know that outdoor activities are the safest. We know that masks are helpful. We know that, you know, lots of things. So. It, 
yeah, it's very hard to to think about that. I think many times it, it's been thought that kids who got infected were infected by an adult in their family. Um, so the fact that the other family members are vaccinated is a lot of protection for the child, just like the gr the gray and blue people. If you prevent the introduction in your household, then your child is much less at risk. Um, you know, that said, you, of course, have to make decisions about child care and your child contacting other adults and other children. Um, I think it's hard. I also have a, a 10 year old who is, of course, not vaccinated and uh, we need to think about some of the same questions. Thank you. Um, our next question is uh, from Mark Lewis. Um, hi, Mark. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, going to find it. Um, hi, Caroline. Um, I love the talk. If the infection now, um, if the infection now does impact the unvaccinated mostly, is there a possibility of a, a type of herd immunity, which is a combination of vaccination plus immunity from infection in the unvaccinated class. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks, Mark. Nice to, to virtually see you here. Um, yeah, this is kind of what I was surprised to see this picture when I ran this model for Alberta yesterday, because in BC we see this more slowly taking off. And I think it's because the underlying transmission rate I had to pick to get this curve is really high. It's sort of corresponds to an R naught of four and a half or something, which is higher than what I had to do for BC. So that just means you get this bump. But then, of course, when these turn around, it really is because the combined protection from natural immunity in the unvaccinated plus immunity in the vaccinated um, adds up to, to provide more of a full herd immunity and you see cases declining exactly like you suggested. Thank you. Um, the next one is um, a depressing question. Um, is it likely that COVID will be a part of our lives for years or forever? Two question marks, and I would put an exclamation mark as well. Uh, yes, I think that is very likely. I mean, this this can get into your pet cat. I saw that PHAC sends out these incredible, you know, daily scan. We read 892 papers today, and they, they do a top highlight. One of the top highlights this morning was um, the first documented transmission of the alpha variant to your pet cat like within a household that's apparently it's quite common in deer and other animals and of course the world is nowhere near eliminating COVID even if Alberta and BC get to this nice uh, kind of near herd immunity subject to importations and a bit of waning kind of state you know we're nowhere near vaccinating the whole world 26 percent the last I checked which was about a week or two ago hopefully it's more now um, but yeah, I think this will unfortunately be with us for a long time. Thank you. Uh, next question is um, also from Anonymous. Um, uh, okay, let's take that one first. Um, how do you address the uncertainty in the rate of contact uh, in different subgroups when you try to define uh, essential workers? Yeah, that is a great question and there isn't a really satisfying answer. Um, what we did here is not uh, super sophisticated, um, but we did a number of things. So we looked at, um, of course, we try to fit the model to data. So that constrains things a little bit because we want the, the model to have some credible kind of age balance of cases. Uh, we don't have data on how many cases there were in essential workers versus not. So we can't fit that part of the model. Um, so we have to kind of fit the overall contact and then use this established method to pull out a contact matrix that has um, workplace contacts reduced less for essential workers or not reduced at all for essential workers than for others. So then when you combine work, school, home and other contact and you've done something different for work, but we do kind of have to have to make these things up. And then we, you know, resample. So choosing random numbers uh, that change the contact matrix then of course that, that gives us these little error bars and it never changed the full message, but, but we don't know those contacts. And I think it's really important because as we try to project into the future and we see things like this in our models, the amount of contact between you know, people who are all vaccinated, all your whole social group is all vaccinated versus a group who's all unvaccinated isn't really captured in this model and whether that varies by age or impacts the age mixing um, also can't be captured because we just don't know those things. And so these projections just have a certain amount of, of uncertainty. And I think if we really tried to capture that uncertainty, 
these would be all over the map. And in a way, I think that's that's kind of OK, because we don't actually need to know that there are going to be 47, 900 and, you know, 4792 infections in the vaccinated on September the 15th, 2021. What we need to know is there is a substantial risk of pressure on the healthcare system and we need to mitigate for that risk. So I don't know if that, it's not, not a satisfying answer, but we do try to handle those uncertainties. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is uh, quite interesting. Um, and uh, I, um, yeah, so I'll just say it and, and uh, please answer you as, uh, please answer as, uh, um, as much as you can. Um, is Alberta direction of relaxing a, a significant amount of COVID control measures in the coming weeks based on conclusions or trends uh, drawn from modeling? I don't think so. I, I'm not involved in the conversations in Alberta, but I, uh, maybe Mark Lewis actually might know the answer to that as, as well as I am. My impression is no. My impression is it's probably from this kind of logic, you know, all of which is, like I said, reasonable, but, but in my opinion, maybe quantitatively, we're not quite there yet in terms of the numbers of unvaccinated people. I don't know, maybe Mark wants to comment on the role of modeling in Alberta and policy today. Thank you. Well, I don't think Mark, we can hear Mark, so maybe he oh. could contact us later. He could, he could talk um, in the chat. Oh. Um, looking at the context, uh, this from Jay, um, looking at the context uh, on eliminated curves entirely early in the pandemic, did this bear out comparing to other jurisdictions with less significant interventions? With respect to social distancing, were you able to compare specific interventions and how they contribute to the relative incidence of infectious contact, i.e. what types of contact are problematic and to what extent? And if, my, if, my, uh, if I may add myself, I'm quite interested in your opinion about US, for example, did they avoid, um, did they flatten the curve or they avoided the curve, you know, with their maximums being in hundreds of thousands? Yeah, OK, those are good questions. Uh, the first one, no, we did not get into the game of trying to tease out which particular NPI had which effect. There were papers that did that, and they did it by comparing different jurisdictions and trying to kind of, OK, this jurisdiction had these 20 things, and this jurisdiction had those 18 things, and this jurisdiction had these 14 things, and then trying to tease out uh, from that what were the different impacts of different interventions. Um, we didn't get too involved in that. I think one of the um, notes that came from that was a fairly simple point that I really liked, which was that let's imagine you have a thousand people, right? And you say, well, can I have a gathering of a thousand people for COVID? Well, imagine one infectious person landing in that thousand person gathering. Actually, you can't have close contact or even aerosol contact with a thousand people in one event. If you have 50 gatherings of 20 people, you're probably just as badly off as, or maybe if you have 20 gatherings of 50 people, you may be just as badly off as if you have that thousand person gathering. So the impact of, of really stopping huge gatherings is probably less than you might expect compared to the impact of stopping smaller household gatherings. Um, that was interesting. There were things about schools, but, but no, we didn't get into that too much. And then your other question, sorry, um, I've lost it. It was in my head a second ago. Oh, um, the U.S., uh, for example, oh. about the other jurisdiction, and I was uh, yep. curious about the U.S. in particular. Yeah, I think they prevented less of their curves than we did, uh, in, especially in B.C., um, but I think all the Western jurisdictions basically took this approach of the so-called mitigation approach, where when hospitals looked like they were going to get full soon and you know you have one doubling time left or none, then you reintroduce social distancing measures. And I think that was all basically um, the same process of, of, of crushing the curve or preventing that curve from happening. And just and that's you know seen just because of the level of strength of restrictions that it took to control cases, stay at home orders, curfews, um, lots of distancing, widespread distancing measures. I think in the US that probably was less severe and they did have more natural infections. So maybe they did that somewhat less than we did. Um, but I still think there was nowhere that they said, OK, so we're just going to use masks and uh, wash our hands a lot 
and have some tape on the floor and that's it. We're just going to let this otherwise that's how we're going to flatten our curve and we're going to let it have this nice smooth bump. It was kind of up and down in most places. Thank you. Um, I believe you mentioned uh, it already, but there is another question on um, is there any data on the ability or likelihood of fully vaccinated people being able to transmit the virus? For example, the Delta variant, which is more transmissible. Yeah, so there is, um, and I, there is documented transmission. It, it can happen, but of course, lots of things can happen. You can, uh, you know, die in a car accident tomorrow. Hopefully, that's very unlikely. So the the best data I think we have show about comparable. Um, vaccination eff effectiveness against Delta to regular COVID. People can get with so-called breakthrough infections. There's a new paper out that looked at viral load. So how much virus is is in a sample from the, the nasal pharynx or the nose, I forget which, um, between Delta and um, other COVID. I forget, again, sorry, I didn't read the paper. I've seen, I just briefly read it quickly. Um, and it showed comparable viral loads at the start of infection and then lower uh, in vaccinated individuals than unvaccinated ones. So can transmit, can have high viral loads at the beginning, but then viral loads decline faster and are lower overall. So hopefully less transmission. Um, so it can happen, but it happens less. So if you're vaccinated, you are less likely to get infected. And if you do get infected, you are overall less infectious, even though at the start of your infection, you may have the same kind of viral load. I think that's the the state of knowledge of it right now, at least the state of my knowledge. Um, thank you. And related to that, uh, I'm also going to jump uh, the queue in one question. Um, do I understand it correctly that pets can contact contract COVID? I thought I heard uh, you say that something about a, a cat. I was under the impression this this was a human only virus. No, it's not a human only virus. It's a member of a family of viruses called beta coronaviruses, and it emerged very likely from a, a bat a host in the fall of 2019. But other animals can get coronaviruses and, and beta coronaviruses. And, and in fact, yeah, cats can get this, uh, deer mice can get it, deer can get it. I think it may be even documented in caribou. There were mink farms, lots of mink farms, uh, the huge mink farm outbreak in Denmark and in other in, in other countries too, including in Canada. So, so yeah, lots of different animal hosts. And that's one reason we think COVID won't ever be completely eliminated, um, like smallpox, for example, because it's not a human only. It doesn't seem to cause much disease. Well, the minks, it's very severe in the minks. They, this will run through and infect 90% of a mink farm in a period of days and, and very high death rates. Um, but in other animals, it doesn't seem very severe. So, so yeah, lots of animal hosts and, um, and it is possible to infect your pets, but I think um, the pets are not what we really need to be worried about so much. I don't I don't think there's an epic death rate among people's pet cats. Uh, <laughs> I think we would have heard. You, you'll hear. Thank you. So the, our next question um, uh, says, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Would a low endemic level of a current COVID variant be beneficial in preventing vaccine resistant, oops, um, uh, vaccine resistant mutations, like an adaptive cancer therapy where wild type cancer is not completely removed, so it can keep more dangerous mutations controlled. And if I may add, uh, is, um, you know, I, I have somewhat unscientific dream uh, that we one day will create a, uh, maybe a virus that is completely benign, but uh, infects, uh, sort of competes with COVID and, uh, uh, and, uh, removes it from from the population and outcompetes it. But I don't know if my dream is um, is complete unscientific nonsense or it, there is something to it. Yeah, so it's a great question and I and I love you know thinking about pathogens and how they compete with each other and affect each other's ecologies. So so I like the question. Uh, low endemic levels in and of themselves probably wouldn't do that because if they're really low, most of the population isn't infected, and so it's not able to outcompete by being prevalent, right? If if 80% of your population has a different type of virus, there's only 20% left for a new virus to invade. But that's not a low endemic level. High levels of immunity and cross immunity uh, would work, uh, but of course, then the hypothesis of an immune escape variant is that it escapes that immunity. So. 
then of course immunity isn't protect entirely protective. Um, lots of people with high cross immunity, of course, would help prevent that. So I think circulate a circulating infectious COVID at very low levels probably wouldn't have that competitive effect because to have that competitive effect, a new virus coming in would have to be likely to hit people who are infected with the, comp the competitor. And if it's low, there's not gonna be a lot of them around. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, our, we have uh, just a couple of questions left. Um, uh, one is, um, says, I don't understand assumption two in the intuition model. What do you mean it assumes people don't infect one another? Right, so I'll go to that slide. Um, that was here. Right, so by that I mean you're not taking into account that by vaccinating a care worker, you could protect 20 elderly people from exposure. Let's say you had a group of elderly people who are being cared for in a particular setting or home, and they're cared for by two staff members, and the staff members go in and out of the, of the home, but the elderly people don't as much, right? I think everyone would, would accept that we protect those elderly people by preventing those care workers from getting infected. And indeed, we prioritized healthcare workers. So when you say, oh, it can't possibly be better to vaccinate others first, you're, you're kind of ignoring this idea that if you vaccinate precisely the others who are going to expose the vulnerable people, you do do better. So I hope that clarifies it. So, so just it, not taking into account that, that you can prevent, you can use vaccination to impact whether people are exposed at all. Mm, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, our next question, um, I read a paper about VOCs and it noted that there is a limited amount that variants could evolve as the spike protein can be only modified so much. With boosters targeting these, could this reduce the amount of people who needed to be immun immunized and reach herd immunity earlier as it could potentially reduce breakthrough infections? Um, okay, so there's kind of two questions there. One is about herd immunity and breakthrough infections to whatever is circulating now. And the other, that was the second part of the question. And the other is, you know, about the possible emergence of new variants. So the possible emergence of new variants, yes, there are only so many mutations that can happen in spike. But if you think, for one thing, it's a new virus. We don't know everything about it. Uh, not everything that the virus does in terms of its phenotype and abilities is, is about spike. It has other genes, they do other things, and they connect with, with our bodies in different ways. Um, but even within spike, suppose there are only 20 or 30 mutations. There are a lot that, that are like feasible, and that's a low number. There are lots of combinations of those. So we haven't explored all the combinations, even if maybe we've seen every individual mutation so far in the land of COVID across the whole genome, we've probably every single mutation must have happened many times. Uh, we haven't seen all of the combinations and it's those new combinations, one effect, another effect compensating for some impact of the first effect, a third thing kind of mixing with those first two things and a fourth thing adding back an ability that was lost by the first three things. So if you think about you know 20 and then the number of ways you could choose four things out of 20 mutations, it's just extremely high and we have not explored that space. Um, if we do get more universal vaccinations, that will of course be good and will help. Um, I'm not sure it would help in terms of herd immunity for the Delta variant circulating today. Um, if it was more efficacious against that variant, then yes, it would help. Um, it would certainly uh, help if we could vaccinate universally with a very broad coverage vaccine that, mm -hmm. that we know somehow could not be escaped as easily as our current vaccines. That would help, of course, but we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of escape of our current vaccines either. So a lot of unknowns there. So not the end of the road yet for the mutations, unfortunately. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think right now we're seeing a variant that emerged months ago, and it's what's causing our pandemic right now. We are not seeing what's emerging right now. So somewhere in the world, if there is a vaccine escape strain that has emerged three weeks ago, we won't know. And we, because of global and local data sharing, 
we may not be in a position to know until it's quite late in the game, sadly. Mm, thank you. Uh, next question is, how does the Sinovac vaccine compare to the Pfizer? I know nothing about Sinovac. That one I'm afraid I don't know, um, but I can direct you to Nicole Basta, who uh, is one of our team of, of infectious disease modelers that mentioned in the, the network you were you heard a little bit about in the introduction. She is uh, developing a kind of where has developed a website that compares all the vaccine products and, uh, and you can take a look at that. I can find the link and, and send it out. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't I don't know that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess our last question is, what is your opinion of Sweden's approach to COVID? And I am also quite interested in that because I heard their their um, um, quarantine and li quarantine limitations were very mild compared to ours. Yeah, uh, I haven't paid as much attention in the past few months as before. But uh, so for those who who you want some background i think the idea is protect the vulnerable by trying to isolate them but otherwise just kind of let many more infections happen than we've done in in the kind of mitigation jurisdictions and the idea was this sort of it was called the herd immunity approach i think unfortunately because that meant that herd immunity took on this kind of negative connotation among people who really hated that idea um, I think the challenges are you can't really isolate your vulnerable forever because people are just um, more mixed than that. So elderly people need care, they need interaction. People don't just interact with people only their own age. Everyone circulates and so it's very challenging to really effectively protect a portion of your population. And also, you know, the hospitalization rates and rates of severe and chronic outcomes in the regular population are high enough that we it's actually not just kind of just like flu and it's OK to let most adults get exposed to COVID over a period of a year or two. And I think that's where that went wrong. But like I said, I haven't followed the data recently. They did have a very high death rate early on in the pandemic because uh, because of these effects compared to local um, other economies or other other places like Norway and Denmark who are nearby and, and who are similar. And they didn't seem to have a huge economic uh, benefit from doing that. And that's partly, of course, because their nearest trading partners were impacted by COVID too. So economies also aren't completely separate from each other. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I think we have answered all the questions or you have answered all the questions. Um, um, that concludes our session today. Thank you so so much uh, uh, to Caroline for her, her remarks, remarks and answers. And thanks to the ATCO colleagues who have helped to put this event together. To all of you who have joined, we very much appreciate your interest and invite you to watch our social media feeds for information about future speaker uh, sessions. In the meantime, please stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.